Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth commanded by you, dear God, and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Our rock, our redeemer, guide me as I proclaim your word at the altar this morning. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. I'm sure that today's youth service has been enjoyable so far, correct? Showcasing the many talents of the youth at our church and their desire to serve the Lord. I truly believe that James Street Methodist Church is blessed with the present youth and blessed with the younger ones of the future. On this Junior Worship Sunday, I invite you to reflect with me the text 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 13, read today by Sister Hannah Innes. This passage covers three topics. Number one, Samuel's obedient, obedience to God. Number two, never judging a book by its cover. And number three, that you are never too young to do God's work. In the beginning of the passage, God said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided my, myself a king among his sons. The Bible teaches us various things, as I'm sure that you all know, one of which is God's sovereign power and his goodness. He remains in control of all things, and no matter what we may feel or think, his plans are always better than our own. Therefore, obeying him is very important. This is the truth we find in the life of the prophet Samuel. Now Samuel was a great servant of God. The Bible tells us that Samuel grew up with God, where God did not allow any of his words to fall to the ground, as 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 19 says. Simply put, the prophet accurately spoke God's word, proclaiming God's goodness and mercy to everyone around him. And proof of this fact is the actual fulfillment of what God says through Samuel. Now, God was with Samuel during this time he ruled over Israel as a judge. However, he had no one to replace him as he grew old, and his sons were far too corrupt. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 3 tells us this. The people of Israel then searched for a king to lead over them. The Bible goes on to tell us that this king would be a man named Saul. Now, Saul was an ideal man someone who towered over others in Israel, we would actually say that he was someone that would make for a fine leader. God knew better, though. He wanted Israel to look upon himself, but since they were stubborn, stubborn, God gave them a king. He commanded Samuel to anoint Saul. And later on, we read that Saul displeased God several times and in several ways. He wasn't obedient like Samuel, and because of that, God rejected him and took away the throne he bestowed upon Saul. This is where today's lesson begins. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Samuel blamed himself, and this is why he was mourning. But there are some important lessons we can learn from Samuel's mourning over Saul. Number one, failures happen. From chapter 8 to 15, we read of Samuel continuously warning Israel to choose God over man. He did his best to point out people to God, but the people were so stubborn like we as God's children tend to be. Despite Samuel standing as the man of God during his time, people still wanted what they wanted, and that was a king. A king in Saul who did not obey God and did things that were not in line with God's way. Brothers and sisters, these failures happen. No matter what we do, we cannot expect everything to go our way. One of the Bible's greatest prophets faced a failure in the form of a disgraced king that he himself anointed. Think about that. That even a great prophet such as Samuel himself was burdened with these failures. Maybe someone needs to hear this message today. Failures happen. The investment that you have made into the life of an individual has not yielded the results you wanted or the outcome that you had hoped for. A friend or a colleague, you have poured so much of yourself into that life and now you wonder if it was all worth it. Yes, they happen. But when we hear God's voice telling us to move on, we must, we must not be controlled by these failures. 
Therefore, it may be time for you to pick up the pieces and move on. Maybe it's time for you to take the risk of investing time and energy into the life of another individual. Maybe it is time to once again lend yourself to the next generation of youth, to say yes again to teaching Sunday school, to say yes again to coaching and mentoring young people in the way of God, to say yes again to teaching them new skills and abilities. The second point we learned from Saul's morning is depression impairs our ability to serve God. I'm sure that, well, maybe not all of us, but some of us in here have lost a loved one, has lost something, and that will be myself included. included. And we have mourned. This is normal. Actually, it is a health response to dealing with loss or failure. Too much of it, however, cripples us and prevents us from doing what we are supposed to do for God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 tells us that God doesn't want us to keep mourning for too long so that we may be so stricken with grief and sadness that we are unable to carry out his will. He asked Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? God doesn't want us paralyzed or stuck in this depression. He wants us moving on with his guidance and his obedience. Just like how we need to move on after a failure, we need to get back up on our feet after we've lost something, after we've lost someone. Mourn the loss and get back up again. Take the challenge to love again. Take the challenge to share again. The last point we can learn from Saul's mourning is that God's plans cannot be stopped. At the time, Samuel must have thought that his ministry had ended. After all, he was old and the man he anointed to take the reins after him had failed, miserably so. He must have thought God was angry or God was disappointed in him, but that is not the way of our God. God didn't see Saul's failure at the, as the end. He saw it as an opportunity to continue to do what he wanted. No matter our age, young or old, we can always work for God. Despite whatever challenges may come our way, God's plans for us can never ever be stopped. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1, God told Samuel to stop mourning, as I've said before. Fill his horn with oil and go to anoint the next king of Israel, the man we all know and the man we all love, the man named David. Brothers and sisters, we might feel like God won't use us because of our age, our past failures, or even our public reputation. But that's not true, not in the least. God's not done with us, not yet. God has a purpose for us. He doesn't look at the things that we look at. We look at the outward appearance and fail to see someone's character as it truly is. However, God looks past our physical being and goes straight for our hearts. God is able to look past wealth, to look past status, to look past our beauty and gaze upon our true intentions and our true beliefs. Verse 7 has been used to warn against judging a book by its cover. What that means is, when Samuel had anointed Saul as king, it was his tall stature and his good looks that caught the eye of the prophet. And yet Saul turned out to be a real disappointment to Samuel, for his heart was not pure before God. God alone can read our heart, can read our attitudes and motives. He's not influenced by our outward impression, nor the good works we may manufacture, nor even the fancy words that may flow from our lips. For the heart of every man has questions, and only God knows those answers. Appearances can indeed be very misleading. It is the one who trusts God and acts upon his word that pleases him. It is the man, the woman, the child, who loves God with all their hearts and all their soul and all their mind and all their strength that satisfies the heart of God, who carries themselves with kindness and lends a helping hand that pleases God. As believers, we all have been given a new life in Christ, which is placed alongside our old sin. Whatever flows from our new life in Christ should be pleasing to the Lord. And if we choose to allow our actions, our attitudes, and our words be influenced by our old sinful nature, while we may be able to fool other people, we can never deceive the Lord. 
for he alone knows the intent of our heart. Let us seek then not to be people pleasers, which may get us high approval from our friends, our superiors, etc., and provide us with a so-called worthy reputation in this life. But rather let us take every thought that rises up in our hearts, every action we commit, every word that we utter, let them be of good character. Let our ways be a reflection of the fruits of the Spirit, of love, of joy, of peace and patience, of kindness, of generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and of self-control. Let us carry ourselves in a way pleasing to him and prepare ourselves for life in heaven with him. Additionally, still showing Samuel's ever-present obedience to God, God asked him to go to Jesse in Bethlehem because the Lord had selected one of his sons to be king. Samuel was scared and he asked, how can I go? When Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. God said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to God. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice even. I will reveal to you what you should do and you will anoint for me the one I point out to you. Even when we're afraid of what others might think of us, our actions, once they're in accordance with God's will, we cannot let this fear drive us away from him. Even when we're afraid of the way people may react, in a, well, we cannot let this prevent us from carrying them out. Samuel, obedient Samuel, pushed through this fear and set off to meet Jesse. When he arrived, he did as God had instructed, greeted Jesse, offered the heifer as a sacrifice, and invited Jesse to present his sons in order to choose the next king. We see that once again, Samuel was judging the quality of Israel's future king by their outward appearance, and not by their inner attitude and motive of, her, of their heart. Let us follow the story. When they came, he saw Eliab, and thought, Certainly, here in the Lord's presence is his anointed king. The Lord knew differently, though, and told Samuel, don't look at his appearance or how tall he is, because I have rejected him. Eliab, just like Saul, was tall and a good-looking fellow. Then Jesse called Abinadab and brought him to Samuel. And again, the Lord did not choose him. Jesse brought Shammah. Come, he came to Samuel, Samuel, but the result was still the same. One by one by one, Jesse brought seven more of his sons to Samuel, and each time the answer was the same. God has not chosen any of these. Finally, Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? Jesse responded with this, There is still the youngest one. He's tending the sheep. Samuel then told Jesse, Send someone to get him. We won't continue until he gets here. When the last son arrived, unlike his brothers, the Lord said that he was to be the next king. So go ahead and anoint him, for he is the one. As the obedient servant Samuel is, he took the flask of olive oil and anointed the youngest brother, David, in the presence of his fellow brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David, and it stayed with him from that day on. King David was the second king of the people of Israel and is considered the best king of Israel ever. David was a shepherd of sheep, but because of his good heart, David was chosen by God to be a king. A mere shepherd chosen to be a king. He was anointed, by, he was anointed king sorry, by the prophet Samuel, in place of King Saul, who no longer obeyed, obeyed God. He was a former shepherd, and he played the harp, so he comes composed many psalms and taught others of the greatness of God. How magnificent our God is, how he shall never leave or forsake us, and how just like David was to his sheep, that the Lord is our shepherd, as we've heard in the responsive reading today. He described how we prayed to God and was saved from many dangers. Yes, David fought the giant Goliath when the Jews were fighting the Philistines. Yes, that David we all know. He was just a child. His trust in God and his concern that God's name is not cursed gave him the strength he needed for battle. Even as a child, David was able to do all these miraculous things. He defended people. He defended his people in the name of God and emerged victorious. 
He led with a kind and a just heart, an act in a way pleasing to God like that of Saul. I say all of this to say that our young people here in this church are just as capable of, as David to do such things. As we saw today in this service, the youth of our church came together and planned a compelling service that I am sure has touched the hearts of everyone present today. Whether they sang in the choir, read a Bible lesson, read a prayer, or delivered the church notices, everyone played a part in building up God's kingdom today and bringing others closer to Christ. This is the power of our youth. The ability to work together and spread the word of God is what this church and its junior worship represents. We can take David's example and carry it out into the real world. Sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles, and leaders, to all of us as children of God, I challenge you today to love and act in obedience to God, remembering whether old, whether young, and whether teen, God has a purpose for each and every one of us, and that no matter what others may say or how others may feel or react, God's plans will be fulfilled. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, may we heed this warning not to rely on outward appearances, knowing that the heart of man can be so deceitful. We seek to be like you, Lord, you who looks through our outward appearance and sees us as we truly are. You even know our motives, our words and deeds. Nothing is hidden from you, dear God. Help us to keep our mind fixed on Jesus in all we say and do, to act with the fruits of the Spirit so that we may live a life pleasing to you. Help us to remember that no matter how old or young we may be, we are all capable of carrying out your work here on earth. Help us to remain faithful to you, dear Lord, as we go about today, this week, and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.